I'm a watchman. You're a watchman. We are priests and priests together in the body of Christ. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Hello, my name is Pastor Bob Rogers. I pastor Evangel World Prayer Center in Louisville, Kentucky, and welcome to Word Alive. Our country is in really a mess right now. I believe you know that as well as I do. And it's very important we as God's people realize that if we don't have a revival in America, our country is going to become a third world country. Divided, our nation cannot endure. And the only way that we can see God move is for prayer. It's for Baptist people, Methodist people, Pentecostal people, Assemblies of God, Roman Catholics, to begin to seek God and repent of our sins and ask God to heal our land. I've written two books. One is entitled, America, Fasting for Revival. In this, I tell the history of how God has moved in our country. I tell how fasting has played an important role. And I ask you to join us in fasting on Mondays and Thursdays, at least till the evening meal. I have also a companion book with it where you can write down a diary of what uh, God is speaking to you to do. And I want to send these two books to you for your generous gift. The information on how you can receive it is right there on the screen. And when you go to the website, when you call that number, I ask you to give very generously and that uh, will not only pay for this material and the handling, but will help us in preaching the gospel. Right now in Israel, the nation's closed down. They uh, have gone for a period, they've not even let people leave their homes because they're trying to break anything that would, is COVID, it's a small country. So the people have been locked in and one of the only things they can do is watch television. Well, there are 34 stations in, uh, in Palestine, and our station is rated number one. It's the most viewed, most listened to. And so people are hearing the gospel, but the bills are continuing, and it's very difficult uh, without your help to, to keep the station on the air. So whatever you can send will help uh, preach the gospel in Israel, and I thank you for your generous gifts. But right now, I'm going to take you into our services where I'm sharing from the Word of God. Today, I want to tell you a story of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is one of the great stories in the Bible, and he is considered one of the fourth, the four greatest kings of Judah. There was King David. King Solomon was very prosperous. There was Hezekiah. But Jehoshaphat is considered a great and mighty king. His dad was a good man, Asa. And when Jehoshaphat became the king, what he did was he commissioned preachers and priests. And they would go into the different villages and they would preach the gospel and teach the people the word of God. And consequently, Israel began to prosper and be blessed. And then when he was invaded, invaded and they thought they were going to lose the kingdom. He called for a fast and the people, they didn't eat and they prayed and God gave him a word and he said, believe in the Lord your God and so shall ye be established. Believe in his prophets and so shall you prosper. And so he would call on prophets and they would come and they would minister to him. And in a time that he was about to enter into war, he called for a prophet, Mahaza. Mahaza prophesied to him he should not go. He said, if you go, there will be many people that will be killed, and you'll lose the battle. But Jehoshaphat was, uh, had so much pressure on him, he went and barely escaped with his life. 
Now, in the Bible, there is much to say about prophets. There are 73 prophets that are mentioned in the Bible. And there are hundreds that are mentioned that have no name. Moses was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. He prophesied to Pharaoh. He prophesied to him to let my people go, that we might serve the Lord. And if you don't let them go, plagues will begin to come against Egypt. He prophesied that God would raise up a greater prophet than him that was to be Jesus. There was Isaiah. Isaiah was a tremendous prophet. He's considered one of the major prophets. He prophesied during the time of Hezekiah. He prophesied more uh, things about the coming of Jesus. And then when Manasseh became the king, and Manasseh began to serve the god Moloch, which is Moloch was the god of abortion. And they offered, he offered his own son, his own baby daughter to Moloch. Isaiah came and he prophesied and told him, this is wrong, this is evil. And they took Isaiah and they tied his hands and they tied his feet. And in, I, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it makes reference to those of faith who were sawed even asunder. That's what is a reference to Isaiah. They took a saw and they sawed him in half. Nathan came to David and he prophesied uh, to him of the evil that would come upon him because of his sin to Bathsheba. Jeremiah, he prophesied to King Zedekiah and he was thrown into a dungeon. He was thrown into a well that was dried and it was a well of miry clay and he was left there to die. So all through the Bible, there have been prophets. In the New Testament, there was John the Baptist and he prophesied to Herod Antipas. He said, you have killed your own brother Philip so you could marry his wife and commit adultery and this evil is going to come on you. And Herod had him beheaded. And so when we talk about the Bible, you talk about prophets. You can't read the Bible without reading the prophecies that came forth. But they prophesied to kings. And no major prophet in the Bible did not prophesy to the leader of a land. And we read that and say that's tremendous. But yet today, if a preacher rises up and he speaks against someone running for office because of their immorality, because they support abortion, because they support same-sex marriage, then that preacher has gotten off the Word of God and he's gotten off into politics. I received a letter from one of the finest families that I've ever known. We've been friends for many, many years. And they said they were leaving the church because I had gotten into politics. And that politics, the Bible clearly teaches, you should not preach politics from the pulpit. Well, when it comes to uh, uh, Obamacare, or it comes to uh, taxes, or our health uh, care, uh, it's not something that is a moral issue, and it's something that preachers should not preach, in my opinion, from the pulpit. But when it comes to sins that are moral sins, that affect a nation, it is totally different, and the Bible never teaches and never has taught that you should not speak up about that. And preachers become the moral conscience. And the fact is, you read here in Ezekiel that we are a watchman. I'm a watchman. You're a watchman. We are priests and priests together in the body of Christ. And so if we do not warn the people, then the blood and the sin comes on my hands. But if I preach a warning and people don't heed that, then 
their blood's on their own hands, but they're not on my hands. And so Jehoshaphat, he had a problem. And all of his uh, goodness, he had a weakness, and that was he married off his son to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And all he had, uh, he had reasons to do that. In those days, if you had a, a, a country next to you, for instance, if you didn't want to have war against Egypt, you might take your son and marry it to the king of Egypt's daughter. And that way you marry into strength so you wouldn't have a war. Well, Israel and Judah were, were combative, and so to take his son, Jehoram, who was in line to be the next king, and to marry him to Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah was her name, there could be a, a, a peace between the countries, and you wouldn't have to worry about a war. Well, let me tell you about getting married, man. If you're like the Rogers people, you have to marry a good woman so you won't go to hell. And every guy needs a godly, righteous woman so you won't burn in the lake of fire. And all the ladies said, yes. and ladies, a righteous woman can take a man who's not righteous and can point him to the ways of God. Or an unrighteous woman can take a good man and send him to hell. And that's what Athaliah did. You think Jezebel was bad. You hadn't met anybody till you met her daughter, Athaliah. Jehoram and all of his goodness, he turned bad. He turned so bad that God said, I can't take this king anymore after the death of Jehoshaphat. And he died of a very painful sickness where his bowels actually came out of his body. And so their son became king, Azariah. And Azariah was just as bad and evil as his wicked mother and only survived one year. And when he died, Queen Athaliah, this wicked daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, she decided she would set up her own dynasty, and she killed all of her grandchildren who were in line to be the king. That all except one. And that was Joash. He was just a baby. And Joash's aunt, which was uh, Queen Athaliah's daughter, was married to a preacher a very godly preacher. And uh, she, she went and she took the child, she took its nursemaid, and she hid that baby for six years. Now, when it comes to sin, all sin is bad, all sin has a judgment, but there are some sins that are worse than others. You've heard people say, well, you know, a sin is a sin. Well, that's not always true. There are some sins that won't send you to hell. You'll get punished for them. There's a judgment for them, but it won't send you to hell. There are other sins that are abomination, which will cause you to fry in the lake of fire. And what is the number one sin is murder. The second most evil sin is adultery, and it's likened even to a relationship that you have with God. Because to commit an act of adultery is disloyalty. It's betraying your family. It's betraying your oath to God. Adultery is considered worse than stealing, which is number three, and lying is number four. It's uh, considered worse than stealing because if I steal something, I can make restitution. The Bible says in Proverbs that if the thief is caught, he can restore by paying seven times. But when you violate the covenant of marriage and you commit adultery with another man's wife, there's no way you can pay that back. There's no way you can pay that dishonor. There's not enough money to pay back the hurt and the disloyalty that you've brought. And that's why adultery is considered the second most evil sin. But murder is considered the number one sin. Now, when you talk about life, life is so sacred in the Bible 
that you are allowed to break any of the Ten Commandments to preserve life. This is why Abraham was allowed to lie to Pharaoh saying, Sarah is my sister, because Pharaoh would have killed Abraham to marry his wife. Abimelech, who was another king, he lied to him, said, she's my sister. Abimelech would have taken the life of Abraham because that's what you could do. You were the king, and if you wanted that woman, you killed her family, you killed her husband, and you took the woman. So it was never considered a lie because of the sanctity of life. I read the story of the rabbi in Warsaw, Poland, during the times of Hitler. The Germans were taking over the city of Warsaw. It was very evident what was going to happen. So he had four children. He had a, a small uh, infant son, and he was able to get the son out of Poland and sent him to Jerusalem where his father-in-law was an old rabbi. And he sent him there to live with his grandpa. He had two boys. They were twins. And he worked a deal with a Roman Catholic priest. He said, would you take my sons and would you raise them Catholic? I gave you permission to put them up for an adoption just so their lives could be spared. And they were sent up to Russia and a Russian Orthodox family raised those two sons of the rabbi, and they grew up Catholic. But he had a 14-year-old daughter who was beautiful. Her name was Rachel. And he told Rachel, he said, Honey, they're, they're coming for us. Your mother and I and yourself will be taken to prison, and uh, we don't know if we're going to live or die, but I want you to vow that you're going to stay alive. And whatever you have to do to stay alive, you do it. But you live. You don't die. And so the only way out for this young girl after she was separated from her family and they were sent to the gas chambers, she sold herself into prostitution to the German soldiers. She was tattooed, as the women were in those days, the, the Jewish girls. And after the war, she had survived, and when she went in the exodus that took her to, to Tel Aviv, and the people saw the tattoo, they knew that she was a Nazi prostitute. And she had sold herself, and she was, she was uh, shunned by the Jewish community. But something very interesting, she ended up marrying an archaeologist whose father, the father and son team, were the ones who found the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And God preserved her life. She was reunited with her youngest brother, and later she was able to meet up with her, her brothers who had been adopted. But she lived. And it was counted as righteousness because of the sanctity of life. Well, abortion, any way you look at it, is murder. The doctors who participate in an abortion are guilty of murder. The mother who gives up their baby for abortion is guilty of murder. Even though that can be forgiven, it's murder. Those who help support abortion those who work in the Planned Parenthood are guilty of abortion. Those who fund it are guilty of abortion. And since 1973, when just a group of men decided that they were going to pass the law of abortion, there have been 61 million babies that have been aborted. Now, let me tell you what happens when you are aborted. And I'm not going to go through the medical turn, but I'm going to tell you what happens spiritually. According to the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter, the tenth verse, it's the story how Cain killed his brother Abel. Abel was a, 
was a, a shepherd. He was uh, one who walked, watched the sheep. Cain was probably much harder working. He took on the same profession of his father, Adam, who was a farmer. A farmer gets up early. He goes to bed late. He works hard. A shepherd lays out on top of the hill and sleeps and chews straw and, and plays and fiddles with his guitar while the sheep roam around. They're, in a way, kind of lazy. And here is Abel, who really shouldn't be the one that's getting promoted. It should be Cain because Cain works hard. But yet because of jealousy, Cain killed his own brother. And God came and he said this. He said, the blood of Abel cries from the ground. The blood is life. And his blood cried from the ground, avenge me, avenge my death. And so Cain was driven from the Garden of Eden to the parts of the north, which would be Iran, where still brothers kill brothers and where there's still violence. But this is why we believe in capital punishment because this is the way you avenge the blood. It has to be avenged or it brings a curse upon the land, the Bible teaches. And so today there are 61 million babies that are crying out, avenge my blood. Avenge my blood. I'm innocent. And it has brought a curse upon the United States. Now, let me continue this story. Here is an evil queen, Athaliah, and she says, I'm going to destroy any seed of David ever from being the king again. And as far as everybody knows, she wipes out the whole family, her own grandchildren. She kills every one of them except Joash. Joash, who her daughter hid and hid for six years. Now, after six years, her husband, her Je husband, Jehodiah, he called for the Levites. He called for the priests. He called them into his home. He said, now, I've got a surprise for you. And he produced this child who's now seven years old, Joash. He said, this is the only living descendant of David. The priest couldn't hardly believe it. The Levites said, this is a miracle. This is a miracle. How could this be? And Jehodiah said, God is a God of miracles, and God has to keep his word. And now we're at this point. And God's chosen us. God's chosen you. God's chosen you. God's chosen you. It seems like there are so many greater people and Christians and people of faith than, than me, or maybe you feel that same way, but God hasn't chosen them. God chose us to be alive. So we have to step into our role. We have to not step back. We can't blink. We have to be as bold as a lion. We have to pray. We have to speak. We have to act, and as we do, God will bless us, and the blood of this nation will not be on our hands. Hallelujah to Jesus. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for us. Hallelujah. I want us all to stand. I want you to take your hand and put it over your heart. I want you to pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, take out of me today all sin, all rebellion, all wicked ways. Take it out of me. Fill me with your love, with the power of the Holy Spirit. I will not be timid when it comes to the things of God, but I will be as bold as a lion. I bind you, devil. I bind the spirit of, of adultery. I bind the spirit of sin, the spirit of wickedness, the spirit of murder off of our nation. Father, in Jesus' name, Roe versus Wade will be turned. Lord, I will speak out. I will do my part in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, fill me with your power. Anoint me to speak words of boldness 
that will cut to the very heart of the matter in Jesus' name for the glory of God. Now I want you to place your hand on that part of your body where you need God's healing touch. It may be on your back. It may be uh, in uh, your, uh, your heart. It may be uh, on some part of your body. Now I bind today weakness and sickness and pain. I command it to come out of your body in the name of Jesus. I speak healing to your back, to your fingers, to your joints, to your knees, to your neck, to your shoulders. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I curse cancer, diabetes. I curse it in the name of Jesus. You'll not have the flu. You'll not have COVID-19. I break off of you all sickness and weakness in the name of Jesus. By the stripes of Christ, you're healed today. You're healed today. You're healed today in Jesus' name. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, give the Lord a praise clap. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, program. And I want to pray for you, and I invite you to stop whatever you're doing. I want you to place your hand right here on your chest. And I, I want to pray just for you. Father, I speak right now a healing to take place in families, in lives, in physical bodies. I rebuke pain. I rebuke problems that would come in uh, homes. And Father, I ask for a healing in Jesus' name. Devil, you have no rights over the people of God. May there be peace and blessing and health and strength. Amen. I want to mention once more, I have the books. Let me do it again here. I want to mention I have the books entitled America Fasting for Revival. I want you to have these. Uh, if you go to the information there on the screens, I'll be glad to rush them to you. And I know they'll be a blessing to you. I ask you to send a generous gift. That's between you and the Lord. But if you will give generously, God will bless you generously. I look forward to seeing you next week at the same time. God bless you and thanks for viewing. God wants to send revival to America. However, revival only comes when people seek his face. In Dr. Bob Rogers' new book, America, Fasting for a Revival, he explores what brings about revival, as well as the pattern for revival outlined in the Bible. Dr. Rogers also shows how America became a Christian nation and takes the reader on a quick tour of various early American revivals. This offer also comes with a companion prayer journal where you can take notes and pray over the things God puts on your heart. We would like to make this offer available to those who will send their best gift in support of the ministry. To receive your copy of America, Fasting for a Revival, simply go to bobrogersministries.org or call 888-613-6080. Again, call 888-613-6080 and join thousands of others who are fasting for revival in America. In the name of Jesus, nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name.